<laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. In my spare time, I have three children under 10, so I mind them. <laughs> Yeah, it was really interesting. I, don't, I presume some of you have this as well. You, you're walking with your children and somebody says, oh, you're babysitting. And I said, no, no, these are mine. Like, <laughs> I'm not babysitting. I'm actually in charge of them and, and, uh, and making sure they don't die. You know, so, so it's actually my, my job. Um, so yeah, in addition to doing all that stuff. Uh, I should say I'm not a board member of the Higher Education Authority anymore. <coughs> my term expired. But, um, but yeah. Uh, there's, there's Charles. Oh, yeah, there I am. <laughs> so while, while, while Charlie is rocking up with that, uh, let me say thanks very much to Joe for, uh, in, and the other organizers, Charlie, for, Thank for, you. for, for uh, in, inviting me up here. And let me start by, uh, yeah, I say we're ready to go. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. So um, I, I want to begin by exhorting everybody to, uh, to avoid uh, the collective sigh you know, dimension of this fiscal space, uh, uh, com uh, you know, everyone goes, oh God, you know, <laughs> Jesus, economists, fiscal fucking space, I don't need this, it's too early in the morning, it's been a long week of lads chatting, uh, stop. Um, but actually it's a very important concept, it's not that difficult to understand, um, it's, it's part of our law, and I think it's really interesting, it's remarkable in many ways, because it's it's part of our constitution. Our constitution actually now has an economic theory embedded in it. And it's a very particular economic theory that's based on something called the production function. I won't get into what that is, but it's really interesting that um, <clears throat> how we choose to measure the concepts within the theory uh, actually gives rise to uh, matters that affect the welfare of our citizens. So it's a really, really important concept, and it's something we should we should uh, 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 start thinking about more carefully. And w what you see is uh, uh, when 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 journalists talk about it, it's really interesting understanding the adverbs and the adjectives that they they put around these concepts. You know, the dreaded fiscal space. You know, <laughs> you know, the harmful fiscal space. You know, and it, it, it is something that I think. Uh, when we have a more mature discussion about it, we can really start uh, 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 thinking about where, where it's useful and where it's not. Um, it's a pretty unique idea, and it has uh, important risks, uh, both us upside and downside risks, for uh, our, our country. So let's take it right back to basics. We measure the economy as a sum of the activities of its households and its firms, the government and its trade with the rest of the world. Um, and when the values of those activities grow, we say that the economy has grown. In fact, the modern concept of growth is biological. It comes from a guy called Darcy Thompson in 1917. He wrote this damn near unreadable book called On Growth and Form. Uh, it's 800, wor 800 pages long. And um, you need to, uh, he, 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 he has jokes in like Greek, Latin, you know, you know uh, Spanish. He refers to Spanish poetry. You literally need to be a classical scholar with seven PhDs to get your head around this book. But basically, Thompson talks about economic growth as being structural change. He talks about, he talks about, so we think about it as just something getting bigger, like a balloon expanding, but actually he's talking about, you know, animals changing their shape, children growing into adults and so forth. Um, so economic growth measures a structural change, but in a very particular and not very satisfactory way. <clears throat> um, when the economy is growing, tax revenues increase. Uh, but it also means that, that, that the structure of our economy is changing. And it is really interesting to note the debate the change in the tone of the debate. So when I was here two years ago, it was kind of like, wait, there's no more austerity? That's awesome. What do we do now? And people weren't really sure. And now it's like, spend all the money. You know, and it's really interesting seeing the flip, the knife edge flip in the, in the character and tone of the debate that we're having. So when tax ev taxation revenues increase, the government can choose to increase spending on particular areas or pay down some of its debt, exactly as Ingrid said before. It can increase public sector pay, increase current spending, increase transfers like child benefit, or increase capital spending like building new houses and hospitals. In Ireland, the government has spent nearly every penny it had when it had it. Uh, one way of seeing this is to look at the change uh, in, in uh, uh, the amount of voted expenditure every year. So you can see that green line there. It's, it's a percentage change thing. Uh, and it just jumps up and down from 2002 to 2008, it's really increasing. So this is the Charlie McCreevy, when I have it, 
I spend it. In fact, can I borrow some more? Can I spend that too? Can I borrow a bit more? Can I spend that too? And this is, what's really interesting is the composition of this, which I'll show you in a few minutes. It's mostly current spending. So by current spending, I mean increases in public sector pay, increases in child benefit, increases in uh, uh, areas like that. It's not really increases in what we might call capital spending. Uh, over this in, on, on a nominal basis, and you can see how volatile this is relative to another smaller country, uh, which is very open, like Portugal. Okay, so there's Ireland in green, and there's Portugal in blue. You can see this is a percentage change, right? We they they had a bananas crisis the same way we had. They had loads of money coming in from all sides like we had, but they didn't increase their spending in a kind of a flahulak way that, uh, that we did, which is a, a really interesting thing. And it's not like the Portuguese economy is filled with people who, who are vastly smarter than us or anything like that. They just simply have a more conservative uh, fiscal architecture. And this volatility is very important because, of course, we're talking about volatility and turbulence in this conference. Okay, so the volatility in our government's finances, it comes from how we spend and what we spend it on, but it also comes from where we get these taxes. Right now, just slightly over 40% of our taxes come from income taxes. Very, very little of our taxes comes from things like carbon taxes and property taxes, which economists call anti-cyclical. In other words, when the economy uh, uh, turns down, it doesn't hurt the state's finances as much. Okay, and as Peter mentioned earlier on, corporation tax is highly volatile. In fact, I actually think corporation tax is a bit like the new stamp duty, you know? Like, it's grand lads, there's more coming in the door, give it out as quickly as you can, you know? And we don't, we don't it, 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 it's really interesting. We call current spending current, but it's actually forever. I think we should call it permanent spending. So when you increase my pay this year, and thank you all for that, by the way, Thank you, Sheila, uh, 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 for that. Uh, when you increase my pay this year, and, and Peter's pay and, and the other public sector workers here, you increase it this year, but also next year, and the year after, and the year after, and the year after. So it's a step level, and then, of course, taxation revenues have to come up to, to meet that every single year. So it's not current spending, it's forever spending. Okay? Now, uh, the... What's interesting about the, this chart, if you look at the end of the chart, you can see everything kind of, you know, the, the volatility dies down. This is because we're now in the land of the forecast, right? And what's really interesting about forecasts is everything's nice and calm and smooth in forecasts. It was really, it was really interesting uh, 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 during the crisis. You know, everything was going bananas. This, the state's finances were going all over the shop. And every so often, you, you know, a, a forecast would come out from the Department of Finance or anywhere else, and it would, you know, it would just be like, it, you would just see this you know, craziness in them go beep, everything is fine. It's all grand. Everything grows at like 3% after a certain amount of time. But you can see uh, uh, already the influence of what are called the fiscal rules, which again, it, you, might, you might like it, you might not like it, but it is part of the law and we all ratified it as a state, you know, as a polity, we decided this. In fact, every single county in Ireland voted above 50% for uh, the fiscal treaty in, in 2012. Only one county didn't. Does anybody know which one? <laughs> You're always at it, lads. You're always at it, like, no. <laughs> What's the question? Because the answer is no. Grant. <laughs> So anyway, uh, the fiscal rules, well, they actually say pretty reasonable things. They say pretty reasonable things. Your debt level shouldn't be above 60% of your, your, your total output. You can't run a budget deficit forever, and so forth. Um, imposing the rules on a small open economy like ours creates a kind of a, a meta-discipline. And the idea is that it sort of creates a, a, a bogeyman. I know, I'd love to give you more, lads. I'd love to give you more. But unfortunately, I can't because the fiscal rules, you know, they're out there. You know, the, the, bad, the bad boys and girls in Europe, you know. Um, and it also forces the political system to be much more open, to, to gather a lot more data and to put it out into the, in, into the open. The fact that we're even discussing what the budget envelope might be in July, you know, this time, 10 years ago, we didn't know what that number was. Well, very few of us knew what the number was. And we're actually having a discussion about this. Um, now, the political system, as imperfect as it is, will eventually, they will find another 100 million down the back of a radiator somewhere uh, the day before uh, uh, the budget. That's, that's, that, that, that's okay. 
But the fact that we're having a discussion about these priorities, you know, you have the National Economic Dialogue, you have the Summer Economic Statement, like you, you have forms like this. It is really interesting that, that uh, uh, you now have the, the Parliamentary Budget Office, which just appointed its new director. We've got the Fiscal Council, the chair of uh, uh, which was here, I think Seamus was here. Monday or Tuesday of this week. So, you know, we, there, there is a, you have the SRI, there, there is now a whole architecture around this, um, which is really cool if you happen to be lecturing in economics, because it means our students are getting jobs, which is happy days. And, uh, and great students they are. So, um, you can see the dampening effect there, uh, uh, um, forecasting it. So, what is the fiscal space? How do you get to it? So, we calculate the fiscal space by assuming a level of growth and asking a simple question. If growth stayed like this, and we didn't change taxes or spending, how much extra would we have to spend while staying within the fiscal rules? Okay, that's not actually a simple question at all. <laughs> there's a, there's a, if you need to break it down a bit, right? So first, you need to assume a rate of growth. And that comes from a model. So how, how much will the economy grow by? You have to have a model that tells you it. Or you can look into your heart and go, three, right? You can do that too, and, and uh, I know many people who do. But... Uh, <laughs> The model actually comes from a, something called the commonly agreed methodology. And this is, a, this is a way of pumping out these numbers that treats Ireland the same way it treats Germany. Um, and it's in, this methodology is incredibly harmful to Ireland and to our interests because Ireland is not the same as Germany. There's lots of structural features about our tiny open economy that are not the same, but they calculate the, 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 the assumed growth rate of our economy the same. And it, I think one of the most important policy problems that we have is that we can't seem to get you, the European Commission to uh, think about estimating what's called the potential output or the, or the, or the structural deficit uh, 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 of our economy in a different way. And, and there's a lot of work going on in the Department of Finance and other places to come up with a way to, if you like, uh, 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 estimate potential output in a better way. It's a super nerdy thing to be talking about, but it's actually incredibly important because if you have a measure of how much output or how much supply the economy can produce, maybe we'll grow, maybe you can show the, the fiscal space is actually larger and you could spend a little bit more. You know, like it, 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 it's a very technical thing, but it could, it could have real effects on 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 um, on uh, our economy and on, and on real people. You know. Second, uh, when we assume some fixed level of spending or some growth rate of spending, we typically do it without indexing spending levels for inevitable increases, such as those caused by demographic changes, right? So if you've assumed a fixed level of education spending, but you have a bucket load more children, well, then you, you, by definition, you simply have to pay more for, uh, uh, for that. We know in the third level sector, for example, there's a huge wave of students that are just going to hit us. Uh, 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 soon and physically hit us <laughs> after a while because there's so many of them packed into so many small uh, uh, rooms. Um, and third, when thinking about the extra fiscal space, there are elements of political judgment and technocratic elements. So there are elements, uh, and I obviously represent the technocratic kind of wing of this, but the political elements are there too. Um, and it's a political judgment I'm going to come back to at the very end. But when you think about volatility and turbulence and fiscal rules, you have to think about how much volatility there is in Irish data. We're a tiny little economy. We're cork bobbing on the ocean, as Peter said. So we tend to jump around a lot, and our data is extremely volatile, right? So today's finance ministers have to almost tune their policies to the fiscal rules. It's very, very hard in a tiny open economy, right? They, they can't run a budget deficit of more than uh, minus 3% of gross domestic product, for example. And under what are called the macroeconomic imbalance procedures, uh, countries have to keep their current account, which is the difference between the amount they export and the amount they import, uh, between 6% and minus 4%. So it creates a, t a corridor for economic policy. And that helps us define, actually, what a crisis looks like. So what I'm going to show you now is a scatter plot uh, of, of Irish, uh, 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 Ireland's behavior over the last while. So on the, on the bottom, you're looking at the current again. So this is, if you like, the rest of the world expressed as a ratio of GDP. And on the, on the horizontal axis, uh, it's net lending or borrowing. So this is the budget deficit, right? And you can see three regimes. The bars there in the middle, they are the macroeconomic imbalance procedures uh, on the horizontal. And on the on the, on the uh, 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 vertical, that blue line there, that's the, uh, uh, the budget deficit rule under what's called the Stability and Growth Pact. So if you're a finance minister, you have to like, steer your economy like a kite. You know one of those little kites you had when you were a kid, and you've got two little, you got two little bits of string, and you think you're great until it like, gets wrapped around and destroyed? Right? Or maybe Was that just me? 
Is that my painful childhood memory coming up? Yeah, yeah. My kite's flying in the ground. There was never enough wind. It's a disaster. Anyway, you see three regions, right? And each, each one of these things is a, is, a, is a scatter plot, so it relates the value on the x-axis to the value on the y-axis. And you can see roughly three regions, and they're denominated in years, okay? So the big, if you see the first small circle there, that's pre-crisis. So we're in the zone, lads. This is where you want to be. If you're the finance minister, you have to shoot for that little box, right? You need, what you'd really, really like to have is you'd like, you'd like to have a situation where you're perfectly, you're, you're not, your net lending and your net borrowing, adjusted for where you are in the business cycle, is kind of around zero, and you, you spend, you, you're, 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 you're trading a bit more, uh, but not too much, because you don't want too much, you don't want a current account surplus, like a ridiculous one like they have in Germany, right? And the problem is you don't actually have control over many of these levers, right? You're like somebody with a little kite. There's, there's wind shear, um, there, there's, there's yeah, you know, your little brother kicking you, and so on and so forth. There are things you just don't control, right? And you can see these three regimes. There's the pre-crisis, the little, the little thing. And then you can see the crisis. You can see the explosion in, in, in net lending. Now, I should say, just for completeness, there, I've actually left a year out, right, which is... Uh, uh, 2012, or oh, sorry, tw yeah, uh, what is it, 2010 or 2012, because um, uh, that's when we booked all the, the, the Anglo-Irish costs, so it actually, the, the whole chart looks ridiculous, so just to, just to point that out, um, and what you see is, you see these three regimes, pre-crisis, the crisis, and then this move to post-crisis, right, the post-crisis regime, so we're kind of here, and we have to get ourselves in there, and um, it's really interesting. So this technocratic thing, we're, we're almost, it's almost like we're trying to hit this target all the time with very limited resources, number one, and number two, with, with not really a lot of control over the external factors in our economy. And so it's very interesting uh, that control and our lack thereof has uh, a repeat, reappeared again and again and again. And of course, the, nobody knows what the future is going to hold, so those things are going to be very volatile as well into the future, right? And it's, it's, I, I think it's really important that people understand how, how uh, volatile uh, uh, the uh, uh, Irish uh, macro data is. Um, and as Peter said, we need a stable macroeconomic environment to be competitive. And the one thing we don't have, and probably will never have, is a stable macroeconomic environment. So uh, we can see here, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the various regions, um, and it, it's really a picture of volatility and turbulence. So, okay, that's the problem. Now, we're t now we need to talk about the fiscal space. What, what is it and what does it look like? Well, if you break it down from the, the summary economic statement, it actually looks like this. That's not it. That's it. Okay, so that's the fiscal space. So in the red box there, this is in, in billions, so it's 0 0.39 billion, yeah? Uh, uh, the red box is, ca is tax decreases, so it, but, but in, in our, in our uh, method, we're going to think about it as spending. The blue box is capital spending on things like hospitals and roads and stuff. And the, 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 the green box is current spending. Now, it's really interesting. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the small print. And as Tom Waits said, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. <laughs> and he was right. He was so, so right. So the minister done it who, a very smart guy, he's got a very, very smart group of officials, branded the summary economic statement as, this is the time we're going to get the capital spending thing. We're going to box it off, lads. This is the way forward. This is what we're going to do. The problem is, capital spending is, is, is both quite small and quite far away, right? This year, in 2018, you, you only have 0.19 billion available for capital spending for all the housing problems, the education problems, the health problems, so new hospitals, new roads, and everything else, right? And you can see the proportions are roughly, after 2019, two to one to one, roughly speaking, two to one to one. In other words, there's current spending increases, public sector pay, uh, uh, in increases in, in, in child benefit, in the Christmas bonus, etc., all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you have capital spending, and then you have tax decreases. What is really interesting here is that if you, if you listen to the headlines, you would say, oh my God, they've finally got their act together and they're doing more capital spending. In fact, not really. Not really. They, what, the, the small print here is that they're going to continue to, to, to increase t current spending, the Christmas bonus, pensions, and so forth, <laughs> as, as much as they have in the past. And they are also going to somehow give away tax t t taxes uh, to, to various people. 
and, and the capital part is going to, if you like, languish. And that is a, a serious problem, okay? Um, and the reason I, I think it's a serious problem is because of this chart. So what this is, is the, uh, how the fiscal architecture of the state has evolved since 1994. So it's indexed to the year 2007, so it's 100, right? And the three lines there are non-pay, pay, and capital. These are the three things the state spends its money on. And what you can see is they more or less increase linearly with each other. As, state, as funds become available, they spend it in proportion, right? But then the crisis hits, the wheels come off the bus, and roughly speaking, pay goes down. It's you know, roughly 80 or 90% of what it was uh, during the crisis, uh, uh, the value of it. Non-pay actually increases a little bit because that's, that's uh, uh, social welfare expenditure and so on and so forth. But look what happened to capital. That's the red line there. It, it's 40% or 45% of what it was during, the, during the, the boom. Now, that's why you have homeless children in ho hotels, because we haven't built enough houses. And that's why you have rotting water pipes. That's why you have Victorian hospitals. That's why you have a, 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 an architecture of the state which is not compatible with the 21st century needs of its population. And you don't fix any of this stuff unless you change the capital structure. That's, you just don't. There's no way of doing it. And another way of thinking of this is by looking uh, at this chart. This is, the, uh, 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 this is how much we spent on, on investment. Investment is a proportion of what's called domestic demand. The point about it is we spend very little on proper investment, stripping out, stripping out the value, the, 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 the kind of the spurious stuff the multinational sector does. What we really see here, folks, is that it, it, we don't actually even get up to the long run average until 2021, right? So now think. Just to say you're, you're at your 20 minutes. Cool. Good. So I'll, be, I'll finish up in two seconds. Yeah, no problem. So when we think about this for a second, we, we know that we need to spend more on capital. My, uh, we know that it has to happen. You're not going to solve the problem of uh, uh, homeless children if you're continually giving away uh, uh, the, the, the sparse fiscal space that you already have to, um, uh, uh, to either public sector pay, and I include that myself, or to uh, current, current increases in things like pensions and, uh, and, and child benefit. You're not going to do that. You have to spend the majority of the fiscal space on capital spending, and that's exactly what we're not doing. And let me finish on this. If, you, if you're going to spend money on capital, you better have the architecture and the capacity to actually plan for this stuff, which means that our national planning framework needs to be able to survive contact with the political system. And <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll have some comments and questions about that at the end. But thank you for your attention. <laughs>